my my life has been a, a series of miracles and the impossible. I actually don't know anybody else who survived my round of chemo. It was all experimental because the cancer was so far progressed that the, the doctor said there was nothing they could do. You were how old? Four. I wanted to ask you guys about the your house getting broken into. Do you mind telling that story? And sure. Do you want to? Um, you don't have to. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, I'll kick it off and then you just grab the baton and run when you want. Um, um, it's a two-part question to everyone. What is the worst thing that's ever happened to you? And what is the best that came from, from that? I was raped and almost killed in 2014 by somebody who stalked me online and inserted themselves into my life. So, and I don't often talk about it. Actually, I don't think I've ever said it like that anywhere. Welcome to the Good Grief, Good God Show, hosted by Grammy nominee and Emmy award-winning hit songwriter of 15 top 10 songs, including nine number ones, Brad Warren of the Warren Brothers. Join Brad during season one monthly on the first and third Tuesdays on your favorite audio platform or in video on YouTube for raw, honest conversation about surviving things that suck. For today's episode, episode 15, Brad welcomes two singer-songwriters, one an actress, the other a musician, that toured with John Hyatt for well over a decade, Claire Ball Owen and Brandon Young, better known as Owen and Young. In addition to music, Claire had an extremely successful career in acting. She played Scarlett O'Connor in the hit TV series Nashville. Claire and Brandon are not only an incredible vocal duo, but they are two of the sweetest and most authentic people you may ever meet. I'm producer Matt Pivita. To learn more about today's guest, Brad, and the show, check the description where you'll also find clickable links to connect to the show on social media and to visit goodgriefgoodgodshow.com. Lastly, if you'd like to help support the show, hit that like and subscribe button and leave us a comment or a five-star review. On the behalf of Brad's wife, Michelle, and segment producer and guest booker, Lisa Bolt, thank you for tuning in. Good Grief, Good God Show is brought to you in loving memory of Sage Michael Warren. You're good to go? This is the first time I've ever had two people, so I did think uh, of you guys when I was looking for a quote, something that would be together, and, and it was from C.S. Lewis, because I love C.S. Lewis. Uh, sometimes the longest way around is the shortest way home. Mm. <clears throat> and I just thought about you guys finding each other from rural Australia to Connecticut. That's beautiful, man. Man, it's a miracle. You know, yeah, to, was, to to have found each other, you know, for her to come to Nashville and for me to come to Nashville from Connecticut, like she comes from Australia. And it's just that sometimes it just literally blows my mind. Um, one of the things that was crazy about us meeting when we did is my very first trip to Australia on tour was with John Hyatt. And uh, we played this club in Sydney that she worked behind the bar and she had quit three months before we played that show. You're kidding. We just missed each other. I have chills. That's the craziest thing. I mean, it's I, everything's a miracle, right? You can live your life as though nothing's a miracle or as sure. everything's a miracle. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. So I have different like things I want to ask both of you, but so I, when did you, what years did you do the John Hyatt three piece? The trio would have been, oh my gosh. Was it 26? Well, 2016. 15, 16. Okay, so it was way after. Brett and I, when we were on RCA Records, played with at Sundance. We had the same manager, Ken Levitan, was yep. our manager, and we managed uh, Hyatt. Yep. And we did a thing with a trio with him okay. at Sundance the Film Festival. Okay. And the same night we played with Cheryl Crow, it was the craziest. And we were very young and very green, had never done anything. It was, I'll never forget, Cheryl started singing, and it was like this club band, and Brett and I were playing guitar, but this club band they had and she just stopped the band and said give me the bass and took the bass guitar off of the bass player <laughs> and just laid down and Stuart Copeland from the police was playing yeah. this crazy thing but anyway John Hyatt's trio yep. was so musically badass it blew my mind it was just I was never and I was like if there's no way Brandon's old enough to have been you would have been like four <laughs> playing there but he didn't have two younger guys playing it was amazing yeah he joined towards the end. I remember you guys played the Ryman together. Like we did one run as the trio. Before that, it had all been like with the full band. But uh, the trio in sort of the incarnation that I was in was Doug Lancio, and myself and John. First time I'd ever seen a guy with like the stomp box doing yeah whatever it was. I think it was the bass player was doing like a kickbox. Yeah. It was just so in the pocket, yeah. and it was really cool. Yeah. That's the, what did you What did you play in that trio? Everything. Uh, in the trio, I played percussion and sang. 
Okay. My sort of main reason for being there was singing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But John Hyatt thing was, it was a, definitely a moment where I was like, oh, this is a grown, like, like it's a grown man playing music. And the two guys playing with him were like, yeah. I'm like, wow, this is really musically a little superior to anything I'm, you know, we've been around. Yeah. It's, it's his songs are elevated. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, he sings it like he means it. Yeah. He does. Pretty good one. And then Claire, I, I can't, uh, the, you know, the basis of this podcast that we can talk about is losing my son and getting in touch with those things, but they're so closely related, the joy and the sadness. Mm-hmm. And there's just something in your music that like absolutely hit me and my wife was very authentic. She doesn't know really music, but they, like it hit us both the same way. So it wasn't just love yourself, their songs and the way you were singing, but there's also something about your music that was joy, joy full and sad and uh, i don't know if that's intentional or if that comes out i know what your your childhood and having yeah. cancer when you're young and start wherever you want to start well i think my my life has been a, a series of miracles and the impossible i was given two weeks to live and i've just outlived my fourth life expectancy which is pretty great um but strange to well not strange because i don't know any different i actually don't know anybody else who survived my round of chemo it was all experimental because the cancer was so um far progressed that uh my parents had to sign a waiver form with the treatment that they originally the the doctor said there was nothing they could do and you were how old four uh and my parents had taken me to the doctor countless times saying there is something wrong and the doctor kept saying no you're paranoid it's your first baby you need more sleep which is totally what parents need to hear um it happens a lot uh less now but a lot back then um so was finally diagnosed in the emergency room because my parents had had enough of being told that they uh they were crazy Mm -hmm. and given two weeks and they said take her home we'll give her you know pain management and hospice kind of stuff and they, mom and dad begged, um, and the doctor said, if you sign this, there is one treatment that we haven't tested on anyone or anything, um, but if it kills her outright, you need to sign this to say that you won't sue us. So they did. The one thing that they said no to was radiation because it would have, I wouldn't have survived that, um, but ended up in a ward full of children who were going through a similar thing, which meant that not a lot of us came out. Uh, and then there was... Uh, <laughs> There was an HIV contamination in the blood bank, um, and my parents had pioneered for dedicated blood donations, which was not the norm. Um, the doc- doctors in, in that hospital actually told my father, who was a flight attendant for Qantas for 30-something years, um, he was a match for he's a match for kidney, for organs, and for, um, for blood for me. Uh, but the doctors didn't want to let him give blood because they said, well, you're a flight attendant, so clearly you're gay and you have another life and you already have AIDS. And then a couple of weeks later, there was a massive HIV outbreak in the blood bank and my parents ended up giving me their blood. Um, And that's what saved my life, Uh, along with a series of other things. So that that outbreak wiped out half the ward in a very short amount of time. And I have no idea how I how I got so lucky to... And you knew all these kids, obviously. I mean, I know you're four. How well you know anyone? But fathom what that did to you at that time? Well, like I said, I don't know any different. Um, It definitely... I mean, not every four-year-old has the experience growing up of the child in the bed next to them passing away and watching the parent, you know, that little one's parent's reaction to that and what happens... um, I think it opens windows in your mind that you can't shut again, but I I would not change it for me. I would change it for the people, the other people that it happened to because they didn't deserve it. But for me, it made me who I am, and it kind of gave me this, well, just got to get through it kind of thing. It's not better or worse than anyone else. It's just different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it taught me very, very early on that the process of dying, as we say, uh, is still part of this. And a lot of people, it's it's like this big, horrible, scary thing. And I understand that because I have a very, I had a very different upbringing mm-hmm. <laughs> and life experience. Um, but I, I don't know, it's, it's nice to be able to work with Green Door Gourmet and it was lovely to meet you there um, and hear your story. Um, just to, for anybody out there who's going through caring for somebody who's passing away or is passing away themselves, that you're still here while you're here. 
Mm-hmm. And then you're still here for a little bit after you're not. And then at some point, everything's gone. I mean, I, I know that you do. I can tell what you said, but like I, I can kind of look at the suffering as a gift, e- even mine. And I'm sure I was well, I'm curious as Brandon, what you're, because when so hard, it does, I don't want it to this be, an, I'm not insensitive to any of it because I'm, I'm, sure. I'm dealing with grief, whatever. But when you're with someone who has suffered, it's just better to be with. It's, I'd rather be with a person who has suffered. It's hard for me to be with someone who hasn't. You know what I mean? Do you, what is, I mean, do you, there's got to be an attraction. Yes, clearly her, her perspective on life is vastly different than most people I know. And her perspective on life, the way, the lens that she looks through, it makes me, it has made me and continues to make me say, there's literally no one else on the planet that I want to live with. And if I'm going out, I want her by my side. Her perspective is um, unlike anyone I know because she was basically staring her own you know, mortality in the face yeah. at a very young age. And so looking at things now as an adult, you know, she sees things in a way that I don't. And, and hopefully we educate each other. I say you probably start to though. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I know, uh, so I, I've become very unafraid of death. It's funny. I love your talk, the transition where it's, it's just, we're all going there. So let's get comfortable. You can get comfortable with it or not, but like, sure. let's think about it. I have a very close friend and he's got this kind of blood cancer. He's dealing with it, whatever, but he, um, <clears throat> if this goes awry, it results in leukemia, and he's had some complications recently. And uh, he said, "Man, thank you for for your all that crap you talk about death because I have not not that he's he's not going to die, but the idea of it is not so monumental that he can't function and live his best life where he is now. And to be honest, I'm living a better life based on the idea that I know something's to come versus." You know, versus the opposite. Oh, it's it's hopeless. We're all going to go. No, I mean, this is whatever this is. This is this is the one shot for this. Yeah. But I know something's there. It's, sure. I think it's almost more ridiculous to think that there's not. Right. Brandon's much the same for me. He he has this life experience that when I met him, I really had no intention of getting into a relationship with anyone ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you like being that guy? You got a really big hill to climb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, Honestly, you were so lovely and gentle. You actually didn't even flirt with me, at least, or maybe maybe one time. But if you had, of, I probably would have run a mile because that terrifies me. Um, what was the What was the meeting? How How did it? It was <laughs> at the Bridgestone Arena for my first solo show, uh, at which I had never. At which point, I had never uh, sung into a microphone before. And the person who was meant to sing with me, some of the duets from the show, which I had to do, peppered in with my own music, um, like bunked out like 24 hours before. Um, and Brandon was called in by a colleague. Uh, and I, you, I was not there for this. Yeah, I, was getting, I was getting ready. I was like two or three days out from going back out on the road with Hyatt. And um, I got a text message. I was at home and said, stop what you're doing, download this song and call me. It was three lines and that was it. So I was like, all right. So I did and I listened to the song, made the phone call. Hey, hey, can you sing that song? Hang on a second. Can you kill it? I, like, I can kill it. Yeah. Great. I need you at the Bridgestone Arena in 48 hours to sing with my client. I think it's 48, 24 hours. I can't 24. remember. And I, I was like, what are you talking about? It's like, we need a duet partner for my client, Claire Bowen. Can you be there? I was like, well, I'm getting ready to leave for three months with John Hyatt. We got rehearsals that day. She's like, tell me you can make it happen. I was like, all right, I'll make it happen. So we finished rehearsals. I ran home, changed my clothes, went to the Bridgestone, met her for the first time in her dressing room, sang through it twice uh, with her acoustic player, Andy Childs, and uh, went out and played it for however many people were there. And then as soon as I was done, I walked off stage and handed the mic to the stage manager and hopped on a bus with Hyatt and was gone for three months. And and we sort of stayed in touch over text, just kind of, you know, kind of once a month, maybe just while I was gone, we'd just stay up and see how each other were doing. And then they were like, well, she's getting ready to make a record. We'd love for you guys to write together. Was there something in the first meeting where you're like, I think there's something here? Or I really kind of saw it as, you know, I was brought in by a management company to do a job. And so I really wanted to try to be a professional. I'm not going to hit on her right, right yeah. away. Yeah. And so I was like, oh. And so I, I tried really hard to, you know. But as you know, songwriting is such a 
an intimate art form. And so as we were writing songs, it just was one of those things where I was like, I just want to be near this person. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to know this person better. And um, yeah. From the moment I saw him, I knew he was extraordinary, but I didn't know. It's just, I wanted to know more. I wanted to know him from the minute you stuck your head into my dressing room. Um, just He just felt wonderful to be around. And I think you knew that I was pretty like skittish because uh, I'd just come out of something very bad. And I mean, our the first single we released is Bowen Young. It's called Skeletons and it's all about like the, the very first time. Yeah, I love that song. Thanks, man. It, 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 it's very pertinent to our story because I was like, do not come near me because I've been through some very dreadful stuff and I don't want to get any of it on you. Um, but that's, that's loving somebody for everything. They are not just the shiny bits, mm -hmm. um, which is a whole other thing, but he, he just, his life experience, uh, as I learned more about him, it was far less frightening to address my own feelings of like, I was falling in love with him and I couldn't help it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I knew that he knew how to love properly because of his life story. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was just from Honestly, from the moment I saw him, I just wanted to know him. I was like, I want to be your best friend. Huh. And we are. And you got it. Yeah, it's funny because you, you, you wind up in that. It's, uh, my wife's my best friend. I used to think that sounded corny until it happened. And I'm like, well, because there's no possible way to stay for the long haul if that's not. Yeah, everything else is kind of yeah. things, you know, sexy has a shelf life and I'll always find you sexy. Yeah, yeah, but it comes and goes. It, at least it comes back. But it, yeah, that, that's only going to last for a certain amount of time. But yeah, that, if that's the only thing, it doesn't. It doesn't work. You started acting before you started singing. Then no, started singing in choir. I was a classically trained vocalist, um, headed for opera and musical theater. Um, and I am having so much more fun now with what I'm doing. Um, but I, yeah, Nashville, the television show, was a another miracle. Like I. I walked, I read that script and I loved, I fell in love with Scarlett and I was like, somebody is going to get this role. You're living in Australia. Tell me how that happened. I, mean, I was doing Spring Awakening in at the Sydney Theatre Company and Kate Blanchett was the artistic director at the time with her husband, Andrew Upton. And um, I was playing the lead in the show, which was something that I, I had wanted to do, but I didn't think that I would ever get to do. And she took me aside after the preview and we were backstage and she said, have you ever thought about going to America? And I said, uh, like on a holiday? She was like, no, for work. I was like, oh, that sounds terrifying. She was like, cool, do it anyway. Um, so I did and ended up, I went out there and for a, a visit, I think in maybe 2011, came back to Australia and uh, was sending tapes over after I'd gotten my, I'd, I'd been picked up by managers over here. Uh, and you, yeah, you send audition tapes. So I booked my first film, first American film off a tape that I sent, uh, filmed that and then, uh, met with agents who really loved the film and they said, well, you, you better come back for pilot season. So I did and came back in two weeks in got Nashville, which is ridiculous. That's wild. Yeah. Most people do like multiple pilot seasons and then film multiple pilots, <laughs> most of which don't get picked up, but Nashville was, when I read the script, I was just love Scarlet and I thought somebody who is more established and it's just, it's just going to change someone's life. She's going to be amazing to play and I'm really happy for whoever that is. So I'll just go in and have fun. Um, and the day I went in for the audition, I, it rained. So everyone forgot how to drive and my bus didn't come. Um, and I turned up looking like a drowned rat and, um, it, my life changed within 37 hours or something like that. It was crazy. That's wild. So you are not living here. No, no. I, the Nashville's the first American city I've ever lived in. So my friend Eric Close was just here. Eric and I have been friends for like 25 years. And oh, they're going to do a show in Nashville. And they're like, oh, cool. What's it called? He said, it's called Nashville. So he stayed with here with us for, for a few weeks when he he came to town. He said, can I just live with you until I get an apartment? Well, oh, sure. Nice. So he came in and... um and then uh, uh, he brought Chip Eston over yep. a couple times, and it's just like it was. It seemed like this little family. You guys became mm. friends. Like I, I wound up knowing a, a few, but I just watched Eric and how like Eric was friends with more people that I knew 
in a month, like he, I think he knew more people than I did in Nashville after a month, but it's like he gets just assimilated into the, into the city. And it seemed like for the most part, there's a lot of friendships that seem pretty deep when you guys were all playing together that night. It's, it's pretty cool. Thanks, man. We're really lucky. We, um, especially, uh, Chip and, and Jonathan Jackson, they're, I mean, Chip really is like an uncle to me, played one on the show, but he's, he's family and, and Jonathan's like a brother to both of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know, I'd, I'd never, I'd really never experienced that, uh, in a cast before. It was beautiful and we're all still friends and we're fixing to go out, um, on the, in the, like the Nashville reunion tour is hitting the UK soon. The fan base over there is um, even more excited than over here. Like, they're really engaged. Um, we love all of them, obviously, equally. It's just very different uh, depending on where you are. Um, so, yeah, we're all yeah, excited to get back, back together flew back again. From, we flew to London. They have a nonstop from here now, which is good. And they, we were coming yeah. back, and there were people in their, like, full cowboy hat, Oh yeah, you know, <clears throat> shorts and boots, mm-hmm. whole nine yards, like Nashville thing. You know, like, oh my God, this is really, it, and it was when the show was, was popular. But I mean, it's hard to get people together for like a Bible study that are not going to fight constantly right. or they're going to get along. It was a really cool thing to watch the chemistry kind of <clears throat> go on and watch. I mean, Eric's a great guy and I've, I've always yeah. known that, but watching the, the friendships and seeing you guys see each other this morning, that's a really cool thing because it just doesn't seem like it's, and I don't know that that would have been the case if this show had been shot in LA. <laughs> the network wanted to call it, they wanted to rename it Ambition and shoot it in Texas. And we were all like, that's silly. And mm-hmm. they gave up on that. Thank goodness. Um, oh God, but, that would have been horrible. Yeah, it wouldn't have been Nashville without Nashville. Look, there was, you know, there's uh, nighttime soap opera element to, to Nashville, whatever it is. But the the music part of that and how you guys were, whatever, kind of, I I give it partial credit for the boom that's happened because it was it let everyone into. By the way, as a, as a songwriter, um, these these corp- corporations coming in and they want to have this songwriting. I mean. We went from a little bit of that playing live, doing songwriter nights, my brother and I, too, yeah. constantly. Yeah. Because I think Nashville and, and the Bluebird, well, I've been playing the Bluebird for, I moved here wanting to play the Bluebird, been playing it for, we right now play once a month called Warren Wednesdays. Oh, cool. Uh, it's a very big part of my life. It always has been. But that show, did, it did, really did. It kind of put a focus. I don't know if you ever saw the movie, The Thing Called Love. It was River Phoenix. Yeah. And it was based on the Bluebird, kind of, or Anyway, I feel I feel like Nashville just took that movie mm. and made a continuing series out of it, and it really did kind of experiment. And and if, for all the things in movies that, like, if you have a pilot watching an airplane crash movie, he's like, "That's ridiculous. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen." Right. <clears throat> so, as a musician, a songwriter, you go, "Oh, that doesn't happen." But the truth is, it was actually really, it was pretty accurate. Yeah. I mean, it was a lot of it. It was really the kind of the feel, especially of of old Nashville. And when I say old Nashville, I mean like five or six years ago. Yeah. The feel of, of the, the writing rooms and even the, you know, it's, it was, it's not all uh, big marble hallways or whatever. It's, it's the little yeah. comfort yeah. rooms and it's the smell of crappy coffee. Sure. And you're not sure if you're at a writing session or an AA meeting, you know, yeah. for me or whatever. And, and that, 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 like you said, it's an intimate, uh, songwriting is, a, is an intimate experience. And so you, you wind up finding things out about the people that you write with yeah. quickly mm-hmm. yeah. that you wouldn't find out in years of just being friends. Yeah. So and I, I think just, the thing, the thing with the show that like you were speaking about the music was like, you know, first season T-Bone Burnett is in charge of all the music, yeah. well, picking, that. picking the songs, you know, producing the, the, the tracks, you know, so you've got T-Bone and then you've got Buddy Miller you know, and all of their friends who are all A-list, amazing players who've played with all of our heroes, mm-hmm. you know, and then it, the last two seasons was Tim Lauer, who's, you know, um, incredibly talented. So, you know, I think the, you know, T-Bone set the bar really high yeah. on the music mm-hmm. and he said, you know, we've got to get it right. If it's going to be a show about Nashville, you've got to get it right. You know, and Callie, the creator, she worked at the Exit Inn, you know, she was- Did a, she really? I did not know yeah. that. They saw this city through a very specific lens, and they wanted to make sure they got it right. And they protected you know, it. they protected it. That makes a lot of sense because <clears throat> I did not know that. But there is an accurate depiction of Nashville that you you couldn't have gotten. I I just knew that no one you didn't just come from LA and look at what everyone thinks is Nashville and, and shoot that. It was very accurate. Yeah. Yeah, the people who made made Nashville, they knew the old Bobby's Idol Hour. You know yeah. what I mean? They knew that oh. place. You know, they knew some of those spots that people coming to town now, they're never going to know. 
you know. I mean, those three places that you mentioned, Exit and Bobby's Idle Hour and then Bluebird, if that, when you put a circle around those three, my career sits in the middle of that circle, of <laughs> those three things. Yeah. Oh, for sure. There's this uh, rumor uh, on those, you know, the the tour buses that go by. Uh-huh. Uh, there's some rumor that we, that Red Solo Cup was written in Bobby's Idle Hour. And, really? And we, it wasn't. We wrote it in a studio in Station West in Berry Hill, but it's like the guy, we'll hear the guy on the thing, and that's where, that's where the Red Solo Cup was written in that bar right there. I'm like, it's a nice legendary thing. Yeah. Talk about well, I mean, Johnny Cass said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So, I mean, hey, write it. <laughs> Exactly. Well, exactly. I guess we're writing fiction the whole time. We may as well make it up. But sure, those, sure. those old places are just really cool. Um, Harlan Howard, I don't know if you ever heard yeah. of him, but Harlan Howard is an old famous songwriter. We we got to hang out with him for several years before we kind of got on the road and then he passed away. He was older, but that that old feel of Nashville, uh, yeah. it is it is slowly disappearing. But I, I, was, I, was, I was really happy to see the TV show kind of Take a little bit, yeah. a little bit of that, and depict it. And yeah, that makes me happy. What's so funny about the bluebird? It's I don't know how to describe it, but like the smell of mm. the bluebird. When I walk in, we go in the back door, and you yeah. walk through the thing. And I love the people that work there. I love the smell of grease. Yep. Uh, or whatever. I don't even know what the food tastes like because I've been there a million times. But I don't think I've ever eaten there. Sure, sure. But it smells so good, and it's just like literally, you become friends with everyone in there when you're playing. I mean, we. Yeah. It's just been. Um, it's just been like one of the most amazing place. I would rather play at the Bluebird than Madison Square Garden. It's just that cool. It's special. <clears throat> and it's kind of cool now that to see it, it's it's hard to get into. And people yeah. are like, I want to come see your thing. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's a songwriters also love this. A place that a songwriter can sell out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't tell everyone there's only 60 seats in there. But, right, you know. right. Still but, feels good. Um, yeah, no, but it, there's something about it. There's, it's really a magical place. It's yeah. special. It was in, in danger of going away uh, when we first started the show. Um, so it's really lovely to see that line out the front. And I, I really wish that there were, you know, more mm. play like Exit In and... Um, Mercy Lounge. Yeah. And, oh, oh, yeah. This place is canary. really torn everything around the Bluebird away, except for the Bluebird and the cleaners. I was just going to really say weird. that. It's like this little tiny little box, and then it's like a big hole in the ground here and a big hole in the ground there, and I they're missed going it. up. The first time they did that, I was driving to the Bluebird, and I just drove by. I'm like, wait, where where the Bluebird go? Because yeah. the whole strip ball is not there. It's just, yeah, it's crazy. So I want to talk a little bit more about when you, when you're a child, what the, the cancer and, and how that shapes who you become and what that was like, because it's, it's funny because my childhood was uh, it's great. I have great parents, great family. They're awesome, but very, very religious, almost culty, almost snake handling, um, speaking in tongues kind of people, and sure. not so much my family as much. Which, by the way, they they did speak in tongues. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I have no idea what God is or isn't. And I'm not judging on it, but it was strange to me as a kid. A lot of the things. And so everything I saw was through the lens. Everything I still see is through the lens of guilt, shame, God's judgment, and have to, having to convince myself I had, lost, had to lose a child to understand how much God loved me, uh, how wide he was versus this, this, this is how you do it. This is what you can't do. This is what you can do. Don't say that or you're never going to heaven. Don't, you know, don't do that or you're going to hell. I don't believe that anymore. Right. But it there's some good to how I was raised, obviously. And then there's also some some totally negative that I, I didn't realize the the kind God that was there. I'm just curious as to how experiencing that at such a young age, you don't really know to be mad at God. You don't even know that. I don't know what your experience was with that, but just it's got to shape a lot of things in you. It, it did, I think, I suppose. I couldn't not. I remember thinking like as a teenager, like you can't see those things and not be changed or not have it affect you. I didn't really have a chance to be anything before I was that. Um, I went through a long time um, once I got out of the hospital where I was really angry at God and was like I still, it, it just, it's just like how could you, how could you? At what age? You know what, probably 11 I think. I was, uh, we, we had a lot of like Catholic faith upbringing and was uh, baptized by like when I was you know when you're a baby you, you do that when you're Catholic um, by this wonderful priest Father Desmond O'Neill and he was a friend of the family and our family is like we're a pretty mixed bunch uh, and you know he 
he was the person who got me into real school. I couldn't go to school for the first few years of when you're meant to be there because I looked so sick. People didn't want their children near me, so no school would accept me, which it's just – I'm not angry about it. I am not wouldn't be angry at anybody for it. It's just – um, a complete lack of education, and it was it was like the late eighties, early nineties, and the the AIDS epidemic was in full swing, and it killed so many people, and the government really didn't want to help gay people too much, and that was where and it was people kind thought of, you could actually catch it from someone, like like you could be like a cold. They didn't understand. It wasn't. I mean, really, that's why Princess Diana, when she went and spent time in the AIDS wards and actually like shook hands with patients and showed people that I always, you know, commend her for that, for, for, I mean, everything she did, but that in particular, just breaking that barrier of like, no, these people are still people, you know? Hmm. Um, so it was Father Des who, uh, found a place where I could go to school. Um, and I guess one of the most confronting things was being, <laughs> I remember one of the, one of the kids, this wasn't terrible, but he was like, you know, boys can't wear dresses. And I, I had no hair and I was mm. wearing a, my little school pinafore kind of thing. And I was like, a lot of my family would beg to differ. Um, <laughs> uh, and just being uh, so puzzled by all of the children walking around with all of their legs and all of their arms and all of their eyes and hair, like, and just wondering, like watching people pick on each other. I actually never got bullied and like when even when I looked really sick um was never bullied at school uh for the way that I looked but I remember other people being picked on for the color of their skin or who their parents were or what they were wearing or and I just wondered how people have time to do that as a, as a very young person being like they have no idea do they um but uh they they couldn't have any idea because they were eight so you know but I think when I was 11 um my, oh, it was like, I don't know, one of the one of the things that you do, confirmation or First Holy Communion or something, whichever one it was, and I wanted my, uh, one Don, my other godfather, to be my sponsor, and they said that he couldn't um, because he was gay and he wasn't Catholic. And I was like, all right, well, fuck this, and at 11 stopped. Um, and my grandmother was like, my grandparents were had beautiful faith, uh, and I remember standing next to my grandma, who did a lot of work with the church, so my dad's mum, uh, in creating equality between the the female members of the, the um, Bible teachings, like mm -hmm. I don't really know the word for it, but making sure that women were honoured as well, like Our Lady and Mary Magdalene, for the things that they contributed to Mm -hmm. The Catholic faith, and I remember sitting next to Grandma. Um, a visiting priest would sometimes say something that was that fire and brimstone shit, and she would just look at me and be like, "Edit that out." <laughs> and you know, as we're you know we're raised with a with a a few different beliefs, but um, I don't have nothing against the Catholic faith. I'm like, if that's where you find your faith, that's awesome. Um, I just don't believe that people should be discluded the way. A lot of organized religion. I think religion. we probably came from a similar. It's because it's funny. I'm charismatic, whatever. And actually, the irony is I'm now Catholic because my wife is Catholic and whatever. But the truth is that uh, I often wonder what does God think about our little cliques and what we've called them. And I have very few things that I feel like I'm sure about. And one of the things that I am sure about is that God wants a relate my relationship with Him now. And whatever he may not be happy with, we can work on that while we have a relationship. But he doesn't want me to try to <clears throat> become perfect so that I'm worth whatever it is. Because I don't think that that's possible. I'm not going to be worth it. I'm not going to be perfect. We're made flawed. I remember being really little and having this image in my head of all of the gods sitting around a, a, a table watching the world and watching what we do and just laughing their heads off. And Jesus being there like, I didn't say that. That wasn't, I didn't, I didn't know. whatever. They stuck me with that for yeah. 50,000 years. <laughs> yeah. Most I misquoted individual yeah. in the history yeah. of the universe. Uh -huh. He's like, I did, I did, <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> but you've got a really beautiful, something I really admire about Brandon um, is his faith. Uh, and it's funny, like, you know, people say you got to do all these things to be a good Christian and go to, go to heaven and all that and avoid the other place that I'm not sure I 
really believe in. I believe in a very thorough cleaning process for some people, but I'm not sure. You know. <laughs> and then others, the really evil ones just kind of wink out maybe. But um, I, you know, all of these things that people posture and do to be good, but he's the most Christ-like person I've ever met. And he's just kind. What's your, uh, what's your journey? It's, it's interesting to me too, because I, I, um, I'm willing to be wrong. Like I don't, so when someone's really, I'm like, but are, are you willing to be wrong? If, if there's the God there, like, are you willing to be wrong about this? If God tells you, so I'm just curious as to like, what was your, what was your upbringing? What was your religious deal? And, and uh, where did, where are you now? And what is, I, I would say it was probably similar to yours, although not on the charismatic side of things. It was, um, quite strict, um, dogmatic, legalistic, um, uh, man, it was, yeah. And, you know, my parents are incredible people. Mm -hmm. The, the people in my home church that I grew up in, I was surrounded with love and, uh, you know, it's like I had 16 different parents because, you know, all of these moms and dads in this tiny, tiny Baptist church of a hundred people in my hometown loved my sister and I raised my sister and I, you know, and parents like, there's no manual. Like my parents were just doing the best that they could. They're making it up as they go along. They love their kids and they're going to try to do best by them. And that's what they did. Mm -hmm. um, but there was also, you know, some teaching, you know, that kind of came from the pulpit that I just, you know, as an adult man, I just can't get behind. And, um, and I recognize that those people are, are, are probably just trying to figure out as well. But, you know, the older I get, the longer my list of questions gets and the shorter my list of answers gets. Amen. Um, Hell yeah. Because I just, yeah. there's so much that we don't know. And I can believe, and that is the essence of faith, believing in something that you cannot prove scientifically. Like you can't prove it. I can't prove it to you with a mathematical equation. You know, um, I know some people would say that they can prove it through science, but you know, I guess that's their, their opinion, but I, I can believe in something that I cannot prove. I, I listened to a podcast with a, a really great songwriter, dear friend of mine who has since passed Busby. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, I did know Busby. I worked with him a little bit. Yes. Um, and he was someone who took his faith really seriously. Never shoved it down anyone's throat. Was not a, he wasn't out there preaching and, 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 you know, banging on doors. And he said on this podcast, look, this is something that I believe. I have a lot of friends who believe other things. I love them. They love me. I can't prove anything of what I believe. It's what I feel. You know, I have felt a change in my life, but, you know, I can't prove to you the existence of the God I believe in. Um, and uh, so as my list of questions gets longer and longer and longer, um, it's almost requires of me to be more gracious with the people that are around me because, you know, because I don't know. And love requires of us grace, to be gracious with others, to be gracious with people that we don't understand their background, their upbringing, where they're from, what they've gone through. Um, and uh, yeah. I, I think that's a pretty great description of faith. I'm all in. I, I I couldn't agree more with every word you said. I couldn't agree more. Um, I had a great family and great people, and I'm not saying their faith is wrong. I'm just saying um, the idea that everyone has to agree with me in order to get— I was at Baptist Church a couple of years ago. Preacher, good guy, good guy. I kind of know him a little bit. But he said, I know some really good people that are not going to heaven. And all I could think is, how the fuck do you know? That's such a shitty thing to say. And I thought, wow, really? Because I don't want to. Here's my thing. Um, I have. I'm. I'm. I'm actually probably close to where you guys. I don't know what C.S. Lewis said. Hell is a door that's locked from the inside. Mm -hmm. Like we put ourselves in there. Um, 
I have some sort of belief in that. I think that just, I just, I, I, the God that I know that has helped me get through the losing of my son is a very different God than the, than the one that was shoved down my throat that wanted to smite me my whole life. You know what I mean? That really curmudgeon, mean God, whatever was there. So I have found this new relationship with this new God and it offended me to the core. And I'm not a very easily offended God. I don't care. I'm, you know, do your thing. But that you're telling me who is and isn't going to hell, super matter of factly, to a congregation of people from a stage and a pulpit. Like, wow, you got some balls. Fear's a powerful thing. Man. And and I'm like, what, but what are you selling? I know some real and not not saying there's people going to hell. I, I don't even, I don't even know. I'm so willing to be wrong now, I'm not even sure I want to argue most points. But the idea that you're gonna tell me that you know definitely have some good people that are going to hell. So what requires them to be good people? Well, it doesn't make sense because doesn't the word God from come from the word good? Good, it's right. It's just about being good. And it's just, I think our legalism and our the attachment to our dogma has kept other people from, we have a saying in, in the 12-step programs that I live by, and it's called attraction, not promotion. And man, I feel like it's so much more effective to practice attraction, not promotion, because if I'm attracted to someone's faith and walk and life and how they live, I want to ask them how they do it. But if I'm walking around, you need to stop doing this and you need to stop doing that. It's just not very effective. Mm-hmm. I don't find that to be really effective. So you got, I don't even, I wouldn't, actually, it's not, it's not um, surprising that where you guys came from, but just the demeanor that you have. When I first met you and sitting here now, I can see that. You have a lot of love, you have empathy, you have grace for other people. And that's what God wants from us. It sounds weird maybe, but I got kind of lucky um, with the way I was raised and the things that happened and what I saw, I have always had, even in my angriest moments, an unshakable faith in something. And part of it stems from being raised in a way that, like, yes, there is there is God and there is there are other figures that that like Our Lady and you know Jesus that we we revere and then you don't piss off the fairies either. That was another part of my upbringing. Like there is, there is so much about the universe that we don't understand and I don't have to explain it all. Um, and at one point when I was on treatment, it was the height of it. It was pretty bad. I was out on a day pass and um, sleeping at home and something went wrong. It was a, I think it was a vancomycin. I feel like it was that. It's like a really, really heavy dose of chemo that they didn't know I was going to um, have the reaction that I had. And I, uh, ended up having a series of seizures and I, I guess people would call it like a near death experience, I suppose. Um, but I, apparently I was no longer with us for, I don't know how long. Um, but I have this memory of being rushed into the hospital and then everything kind of went hazy and I saw myself, people, this is such a, it sounds like a cliche and I know that people talk about like the tunnel and seeing themselves from the ceiling and, you know, but it happened and I don't need people to believe me if they don't and they can laugh at me if they want. I really am very difficult to offend as well. I don't care. Mm -hmm. But I remember seeing my very small young self from the ceiling being worked on, on a gurney by several doctors and nurses and working like, and there were tubes everywhere and blood everywhere. It was awful. Um, and, uh, they, all of a sudden, like all of the pain went away, all of it. And I was in a tunnel that was the most beautiful thing. It was like this, this texture and color that was like, it was like a, like a black rainbow like a, like a black opal kind of thing, like that iridescence, almost like there are lots of colors in an umbilical cord, that kind of thing. And moving, the whole thing was moving and there was a light, but a beautiful like glow at the end. And there was a figure standing there. And I remember I I wasn't walking, it was like floating down this tunnel towards this light. And I knew I was safe and I was loved and there was no more pain. It was amazing. And they went, there was this silhouette of a figure. I couldn't see their face, like no details, but I did see them go like that. And then it was like being sucked, like a great big vacuum back, backwards and 
I woke up like it was very odd. And I think I know who it was. I think as two people that it could have been now that I think about it. Um, but, uh, one one of them is my uncle Chris, who died when he was seventeen in a motorcycle accident, and he came to get my nana when she was dying. Um, but it was it happened, and I've even before that I knew because I've always had windows open in my mind that there is something else, and it's okay if other people don't believe it. I mean, I, you have no way of knowing this, Mark, but I am a complete NDE freak. Um, oh really? I have become. Uh, yeah, I've I've read in the last three years since losing my son. For some reason, it's given me comfort. Mary C. Neal, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, she's a, um, she died in a kayaking accident. Yes, yes. And whatever, 15 minutes, she was yeah. underwater. Yeah, it's crazy. <clears throat> she has two books. I talk about them on here all the time. Amazing. Her book, Seven Lessons from Heaven, literally got me through the death of my child because I it was so tangibly real. Everything she said validated everything that my heart ever, it's not information that I'd gotten, but her everything she said about her experience validated the way I felt inside. So I've been on a, I've watched mm -hmm. so many YouTube near death experience things that I would, if it was a, if it was weaponry, I would be on a, some sort of list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh -oh. And I've read a lot of books and I actually have two really good, really close friends that have near death experiences. And um, people, many of people don't necessarily talk about it because they think people are going to make fun of them, or and, and both of you know um, the people I know. But I believe it with ever. Not only do I believe it, but I need it now. I need to know that. I'm so glad you said that, uh, and we didn't miss that chance because I do. Not only do I believe it, but I accept it. It's like a comfort for me because one of the things that you get to do coming back from that is give me comfort in what I really believe, which is that something's there, which is my son that I get to see one day. And I think that's a gift that we are given by God yes. to let us know, hey, it's okay. That feeling that you feel that your loved one is with you, it's it's not just a feeling. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just real. over the horizon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Outside, I mean, people can... I have a very, I mean, coming from being cured by Western medicine and um, I'm absolutely obsessed with medical science and the history of medicine, all that kind of stuff. And so like, yes, if you want to say that it's a disorganized brain firing off neurons that are dying and that's what, you know, that, that chemical release so that death doesn't hurt or whatever, that's okay. I don't mind, but it Mary happened Neal has and an it's entire, not my fault. Yeah. Mary Neal has an entire chapter in her book. It's it's actually kind of dense material, but she's a surgeon and she's mm -hmm. extremely smart and she studied and went to it. And there is no medical explanation. There's no there's no um, uh, hallucination, dream explanation for what she experienced. She and she did the work to, and she she writes a chapter on it. It's oh, pretty amazing. Yeah, I've had MRIs on my like just to make sure that I because I for a long time I thought that chemo had kind of maybe damaged my brain or something like that. But my, my doctor, my functional medicine doctor was like, no, your brain's, um, that's great. Uh, but can I use the scans in a study? I was like, fuck, what, what, what's wrong with it? He's like, no, nothing. It's just really loosely connected down the middle. I forget what, what that particular part is called, but most people's brains are very densely connected. And mine is really, the two hemispheres are really loosely connected. But there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. So I, I'm like, believe me, I went down the rabbit hole of being like, I might just be fucking crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and aren't we all a little bit? Um, do you do you remember it clearly? Yeah. Because I have every, my two friends and then the tons of ones that I've, the books that I've read and the things that I've watched. It's it's like my one, one of my friends, is he's 60 and he was like nine. A pencil went through his head and whatever. <clears throat> and Goodness. And he went went to heaven and kind of a rope, and he just was. It's the feelings that you described, whatever. And then he just had kind of got a no, like you can't stay. And then a hand cut the rope, and he was back. And but it was all this the tunnel and the, the warmth and the love for being unconditionally loved, just for being who you were, not for anything you'd accomplished, just unconditional love, yeah. which is a very common thing. But he's it's fifty years ago, and he's like, it's clearer to me than what I had for lunch today. And I'm like, yeah. wow. So I was curious. It's it's that clear to you still? Yeah, I have a photographic memory, and I can't get rid of it. I can't <clears throat> help it. I can't forget it. I could never forget it. Um, Would you want to though? Fuck no. no. No, it was. It's part of me. It's part of. I don't know. It doesn't like again. 
no better or worse than anyone else, just different. Yeah. And it happened and I can't help it. It wasn't my fault. So mm-hmm. um, it, it was funny. I, for the longest time, I I was really, I, I always, I still am, but drawn to, and this is why I said black opal, drawn to iridescence and um, but like dark, but like little lights in the dark and the like absolutely falling in love with the look of a dark opal and being fascinated with the way an umbilical cord is the colors in it and like the structure of it. And it, I didn't realize until much later on in my life after being realizing that, you know, our bedroom is covered in things like that, these little points of light in the dark that, Oh, that's what, that's what it looked like. Um, but you know, and it wasn't a profound, it was, I mean, I guess profound, but the, the feeling of unconditional love I already knew because that's what my parents right. and my family gave me. So that particular part of it wasn't a jolt. It was the pain in my body that went away. That was like, I'll never forget that feeling ever. I've studied so much that I always would tell people when they're afraid of dying, I'm like, if you're in pain, don't worry, you you're not afraid. dying. You're yeah. not dying. Yeah. Because I, I, on the thousands that I have researched, yeah. the pain's gone. Physical pain is not part of that process. When when that goes, when that pain that goes away, you may have crossed crossed over, and it's and it's you know yeah. the lights are out. But if you're still feeling pain, it's you keep fighting. You're probably going to live, or however that goes. I don't. It's funny to me now. I I wonder if I got into. I get in the salt water a lot in the ocean, and I just think, if, if I'm fighting a shark, am I going to – I'm comfortable enough with the crossing over to go, oh, let's just duke this out with this shark and <laughs> see what's on the other side of this thing. But I'm so glad that you shared that because that's yeah. – that to me is the um, – it's like the point. And, and it's not um, – we all want to explain it and put it within the scope of what we already believed, which is fine. As long as we're admitting that. So like you said, I'm not wanting someone to – to believe, I don't even know enough of how I believe to want someone to believe like I believe. I believe what I was taught as a kid. By the way, I do believe in Jesus. I believe he's the son of God. And I believe in the Trinity and these things, but I'm not angry at somebody else who doesn't have that belief because I feel like they can find God. There's so many paths to God. And my family and church were walking up this one path. And then I obviously, my brother and I, we, we, you know, the first time we did, it. the first time we did cocaine and didn't die, I was like, they were lying. This isn't going to kill you. Are you kidding me? The greatest night ever. Um, <laughs> and, you know, but we were convinced that we grew up with no television, no alcohol, no cussing, yeah. no nothing. So um, you had a lot of catching up to do. A lot of catching up to do. Boy, we made it for lost time. Yeah. You know, the whole the whole gamut. And so when we, when we got out and figured it wasn't necessarily going to kill us, and I have kind of just vowed as long as God was okay with him just be the cussing Christian on the way out, you know, like yeah, sure. my mom hates it, but she's, she's learning to live <laughs> with it too. She knows my heart. And, um, just all that legalism, it, 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 it didn't work for me. The, the fear of, I was terrified of hell, mm. terrified. If you grew up in the kind of church with a dog bun and it never stopped me from bad behavior. All of that fear of hell never kept, I, I was off the rails. And then when I stopped being afraid of hell and I found an actual God in recovery that was a power greater than myself, that was much more generic, mm. was much less legalistic, my behavior changed because my heart changed because I had a relationship with this being that I was trying to please before. Mm. It's strange to me how yeah. we we want to get to a point where we're good enough for God and I'm, not, I'm just not going to be. Yeah. I'm not going to be. I mean, it's like, it's like um, a friend of mine says with alcoholics, we're the only kind of people that, that want to that get a gift and want a reward to go with it. We've been given this gift mm. of faith in God. Mm-hmm. We can't earn it. And, and I just had to learn that, like, stop trying to earn it. And I feel like you kind of felt that really early on. A little bit of like, okay, what's next? I can take anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I just didn't know any better. And going... To like listening to some people who talked very dogmatically about religion and and what God was and what you had to do to you know get the keys to heaven and all that stuff, I was like, yeah, that's not it. Like it was like, what are they talking about? Because it's not that's not that's terrifying. Like some of the the, the fear and the guilt that and you know like my Catholic guilt sometimes still gets me, but not very often now. <laughs> we call it Baptist guilt, so I guess it's probably the same brand. It's the same thing. 
They're on the same shelf. I got to be honest. When I started going to Catholic church with my wife, I was still drinking at the time. And I was like, this is my place. These people have liquor at every event. <laughs> yes. They're totally cool with drinking. I'm like, this is, I didn't think there was any guilt. But then I realized there's Catholic guilt as well. Sure. Baptist guilt was like, if you had a drink or a cigarette or whatever, then you're, it's, you're going, you're definitely going to hell over that. Yeah. The same guilt, less incense. <laughs> Same girl, that's less incense. Funny. That's a t-shirt. Well, you'll have rock music for Jesus and stuff, Spanish. Like certain some of you know, not where not where I grew up. It was it was great. a piano and an organ, and that was it. So well, we you played, never, I learned there, to play in the church band. So. Yeah, I mean, and that that was the thing. There's so many different like variations of, of, yeah. of that sort of program in our church. It was like you don't guitars don't belong, it's piano and organ. Baptist? Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I mean, that's where I learned how to sing. Singing at my bedside with my mom at night and singing in the choir at church. That's where I learned how to sing. You know, that's where I got up in front of people for the very first time. And, you know. In the choir or the solo? Did you do solo? Yeah, mom put me up and I think I did my first solo when I was four or five years old. Wearing jeans, a white t-shirt and a rain, rainbow suspenders. So, so um, cute. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about the about the uh, your house getting broken into. This story you, you told you told talked about it when when I saw you play live. Do you, do you mind telling that story and sure. how strange that is? Sure. Do you want to? Um, you don't have to. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, I'll kick it off, and then you just grab the baton and run when you want. <laughs> um. It was about 11.45 on a Sunday night, and the dog and I went upstairs and got into bed. And, um, I mean, I literally wasn't in bed two minutes and um, saw the ring camera on the front door alert go off. So I I got up and checked the front window, and there was a man standing on the bridge right at our front door. And as I came back into our room, Claire said, "Uh, baby, there's somebody out front. And I said, yeah, I see him. I'm pulling my Ugg boots on and Claire jumps out of bed and she said that we have a 200 pound Irish wolfhound who sleeps at the foot of our bed and uh, his name's Phelan and Claire said, Phelan, come. And so the three of us went down to the front door, uh, which is sort of on this like landing between the bedroom level and the mid level of our house. And uh, we're looking through the little window and we can't see anybody. And, you know, kids check car doors and maybe they're looking for whatever they can kind of boost and move on. But we didn't see anybody um, out there in the driveway. And I thought maybe he had just walked off and we have a brass mail slot. So Claire sort of rattled that to let anybody who was within earshot know that there was somebody in the house. And I said to Claire, I said, "Uh, I'm just going to go down to the mid-level and check. So I, as I walked down the stairs and turn the corner to go into where the the kitchen and TV room is, I heard the alarm system beep and the back door to the kitchen slide open because that's where we, we keep the recycling hanging on that doorknob. So I heard the aluminum cans in the bag slide across the tile floor. I, I immediately turn around and say, Claire, he's in the house, get upstairs. And the three of us ran up the two flights of stairs, got into our bedroom, closed and locked the door. Claire immediately called 911. Uh, and we got behind the bed because we didn't know if the individual was armed or not. Um, am I missing anything? Uh, well, we just, we've sat there and, um, we're talking to 911 and they were like, we're about, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour out. Um, I was sitting on the floor with the dog at my hip because I didn't, he would go for somebody who tried to hurt us. That's what wolfhounds do. Mm -hmm. They're really placid animals otherwise, but if you mess with their people, you're lunch. Um, So I had him next to me, Phelan, don't you move. And he was trembling from like nose to tail tip. It's like his fur was all standing up on end and it was like vibrating like uh, like grass in an earthquake. Um, And we we waited and we were on with 911. They're reassuring us. They were wonderful. Dispatch was incredible. And we're listening to this person very slowly and methodically walk around the floor below us. And we talked about this later. We both had the same sort of train of thought that included, well, you know, he'll, he's got to walk past the music room and 
all the guitars and things like that. He'll take those and he, the truck keys, you can't miss them if you're going for the front door and that's the closest way to get out. It's kind of, it all happens in a line Mm -hmm. and clearly he already knows where the truck is because he was hunting around that. That's what I saw on the security camera before. That's when I said like, Mm -hmm. there's somebody out front. Um, the, the truck was the first thing he checked out. Um, so we thought it's, it's fine. It's awful getting broken into. Like, it's not not a good feeling, but you end up just like, just take the stuff and go, go, fuck off. I don't care. Oh, sure. Yeah, if it takes you five trips to get all the shit out of there, you be my guest. Um, but he walked past all of that stuff. And our house is very old, so you can hear exactly wherever somebody is. Uh, and I heard him put his foot on the first step that was heading past the music room and up to our bedroom. And my heart just, I mean, my heart was in my throat and my stomach was somewhere. I don't know. It was like just everything kind of dropped because I knew then that he wasn't there for the things that he could steal. He Mm -hmm. wasn't there to steal anything. He was there for us. And I thought, I wonder if he knows this place. And he, he clearly knew the house already. Um, the way he got in at the back is like our house is a rabbit warren and there's a this weird tiny spiral staircase up the back that he had to climb up and it took him no time at all. He knew exactly what he was doing and where he was going. Um, mm-hmm. And when he came upstairs slowly, methodically, which was creepy as hell, um, he there, there are multiple rooms on the top floor and he came straight to our door and I'll never, ever forget seeing the doorknob turn. And feeling like the, not, there was no fear. It was weird. We didn't panic. It was scary, but not panic scary. It was more like decisions being made very quickly in in our heads of like, okay, it's escalated to this. This is actually like he's crossed a line. And when he started to try and beat down the door, um, his actions were very violent, but his voice was calm. And Brandon warned him, um, if you come through that door, you're going to die tonight. Uh, something really bad's going to happen. And the guy said to Brandon, go fuck yourself. And warned him again. And he said some very scary stuff. Part of it being, um, you're going to open the door. Open the fucking door. Yeah. And hearing that, and then he started throwing himself against it and doing everything he could to get through it. Um, meanwhile, dispatch is telling us to hang in there and um, the realisation that I would do anything to protect Brandon, and he, we talked about it later, he was feeling the same thing about me. And was, there's one thing, I've had my life threatened before, and eh, it's not nice, but there's nothing that it didn't come close to feeling, um, the feeling that I got when somebody threatened Brandon, mm-hmm. take sure. my whole world away. Uh, and I don't feel bad about those feelings anymore <laughs> at all. But, um, we were really lucky. There was an officer who forgot that he was on roster that night and was, his mates called him from the station and said, where are you? And he said, I'm on the couch. And they were like, no, you're in the station. You're supposed to be on this evening. Um, you're on the roster. And he got himself together real quick, threw his kit on, jumped in the cruiser, and our call was the first one that came through, and he just happened to live two miles away from us. And that is the only reason that the police, it was crazy. Like the door was splitting. This guy was putting his full weight, trying to pull the doorknob out of the door um, and bash his way through it. It was just like this sudden extreme violence, and I knew that if he got through that door, he was going to. I mean, the police confirmed it later what he was going to do, and it would, yeah. Um, and uh, that that officer being forgetting that he was on the roster was the only reason that the police got there. Just like, literally like a movie that I like, I wasn't being paid to be in, which is fucking rude. (laughs) Um, Just in time. Kind of one of those things when it was all said and done, you really couldn't believe that it happened. It felt crazy. First thing we said to each other when the detective left was, did that really just happen? Before we go, thank you guys so much, by the way. You're you're awesome. You're very sweet people. And I'm just 
so honored to get to, to be able to spend time with you. Um, I try to ask a question, and I want to ask you separately. Um, it's a two-part question to everyone. But um, I guess we'll start with you, Brandon. No, ladies first. But what is the what is the worst thing that's ever happened to you? And what is the best that came from, from that? Hmm. I was raped and almost killed in 2014 by somebody who stalked me online and inserted themselves into my life. My lawyers said, you were dealing with a psychotic individual and we're surprised that you're still alive. Oh, and I don't often talk about it. Actually, I don't think I've ever said it like that anywhere, <laughs> except privately. Um, and I, it was that thing where I had to, I had to leave my house while this person was at work and hide at a hotel in town and then lived with a friend and I hid um, in plain sight because I was on the television. It was the strangest thing. Um, <laughs> it makes my heart pound just thinking about it. And uh, I lived, clearly. Um, but I was really banged up and very, you know, this person left left all the marks where no one would have the indecency to look. Really nice guy. And uh, then I, I started in with trauma therapy. That was the first time I'd ever really done it. And on that journey, I discovered that, what, like, what PTSD really was, and like that which I have from growing up in a hospital, watching people die all around me, all the time. And one very important part of that which caused me to, to allow dreadful people in my, into my life for the longest time without knowing that I was doing the wrong thing was survivor's guilt. Why did I live and the others didn't? I had very little self-esteem, probably zero self-worth, um, and figured that it didn't matter the way I was treated. As long as I was breathing, that's all I deserved. So I let people treat me. I gravitated towards, not gravitated towards it. I think I attracted people that wanted to take advantage because they could see that I just wanted to see the best in people. I blame myself as zero of this. And anybody out there who has been through sexual assault, domestic violence, or being taken advantage of by a con artist, it's not your fault. Um, it's the first thing that you think, gosh, what? How did I get to this place? How did I become that person? Um, so I did all of this therapy and all of this research and hyper fixated on what it was to have survivor's guilt and what it was to allow oneself to love oneself. And it was all just in time. It was very soon after that, that I met Brandon for the first time. And the, that was the thing that I I was saying to him, like, it's all over me and I can't get it off and I don't want to get any of it on you because you've been through enough. Um, and all of that, using my brother's terminology, he he always calls me an absolute weapon because <laughs> I'm very difficult to kill, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> you have not been robbed of a full plate. No, but uh, I... I would like to say that I became a weapon of love and I, I worked and I worked and I worked and realized that I had met this beautiful man, the person of my dreams that I didn't know was in my dreams that I didn't think existed. And I had to, I'm so glad that I did all of that work and discovered all of that before I fell in love with him or in the middle of it. I was, you know, I was still waking up screaming when Brandon and I got together and like we'd been courting and, I remember the first time that happened and you were so wonderful and you rolled over and grabbed me and you said, baby, it's me, it's Brandon, it's Brandon, it's not, you're not there anymore. Because I was screaming my head off, probably worked the whole Worthen up. Um, we used to live down in Germantown, but uh, it, uh, it drew me to, it, it, sorry, it's hard to talk about it because I don't. Um, I am grateful not because it's okay what happened to me or what was done to me very deliberately. Um, but it 
help me love Brandon more because I learned how to love myself and know that I deserve to be here and I deserve to be loved and treat, be treated kindly. So, I don't know. Some things you don't get over, you just get through them and <clears throat> your heart breaks and I guess it gets bigger or some shit. I don't fucking know. I have to tell you, thank you for sure. I mean, that's that's awesome. Sorry. That you, no, it's great. It's great. Because I honestly thought if, if you could have something worse than having cancer and almost dying at four, I'll be really surprised. But shit, you do. It was worse than I cancer. Mean, um, that person is cancer. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and unfortunately, there you know, there is evil in the world. Um, yeah. I've met it. I wouldn't change it. And I would much rather be me who, you know, almost bled to death in my shower because of what was done than the person who did it. Right. So- if you got to pick one, there it is. There it is. <clears throat> All right, top that. <laughs> don't, don't top that. Well, thanks very much, everybody. This has been great to hear. God, it's not a competition. No, no, no. That's, that's a, that was bad terminology. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, man. You know, I think the question was, you know, what's the worst thing that's been done to you? And, I mean, I don't... Or happened to you. It could be... Yeah. Happened to me. I, You know... If, I mean, I think th this didn't happen to me, but, you know, I would say uh, the worst thing that that I can think of happening in my time here on this planet is, you know, four and a half years ago, losing our godson. Um, uh, I don't, uh, you know, and you ask, like, what's the best thing that came from it? I, I don't know. There's some things that you don't get the I answer for. I don't I don't have an answer for um the you know what that is yet. So uh but you know I had we got to walk through it together, walk through it with um you know our best friends, uh who was their son. Um and our group of friends that gathered around them to uh, try to do the impossible. support, you know, in utter de devastation. So, um, yeah, I don't really know what the um, what the best thing that will come of it is yeah. yet. But well, you're here. <clears throat> um. And this, this, it's like I, I'm with you. By the way, and I, how old was your godson? He was five months old. Five months, five months old. Yeah. So this, I mean, um, one of the things I've discovered is it doesn't matter if the child is a day old or fifty. A parent losing that child, yeah, it's just not the natural order of things. No, it's just can't it's imagine. life changing in all the ways that you don't want it to be. So I, um, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I would, I would. That would lose my son would be the worst thing that ever happened to me. The best thing that came of it, like you said, may not be tangible. Mm. Um, but I can tell you this: I'm 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 better. <clears throat> I'm better at everything. I'm I'm a better dad to my other two boys than I. I mean, it's I you know I wasn't some hellion dad. I was, I was we worked hard with Sage. He was loved. He, he had he had a substance abuse problem, and and he got bought fentanyl and he didn't know he was buying it and it was you know there's a lot of things you could just go on angry whatever but <clears throat> i'm a better father i'm a better husband i'm a better friend i'm a better brother um son all of these i mean i talk about this and so the uh you know the idea that i wouldn't be doing this podcast i the, all the things you want to do a podcast about i want to be joe rogan and talk about mma Shit. I don't want to talk about grief. And, yeah, sure. And but that is God's if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans, you know. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so my plan's not being this. So I don't know about you, but you probably like me would rather not be able to talk about your godson. But you were there to able to be there for the parents. You're able to talk about it here <clears throat> in an uncomfortable situation. And that gives comfort to the people going through it. It does. It just does. I needed to hear. One of the reasons I'm doing this, one, I needed to hear people that were also going through this. That's why I have the, the, the father's group, because you need, misery needs company. It doesn't just want it. Like, it doesn't just love it. It needs, sure. we need to be with people that are fellow sufferers and that specific thing. So I, I think that the good things are happening. And I just see the kind of people that you guys are and, and how you probably are to the, 
the people that are around you and your friends, and it's you, it may not be tangible, but I I can I feel like I can see it already. I don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. So, uh, thank you guys, amazing. You're amazing people. So so fortunate to to uh, to get to know you, and and uh, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you so thank much you for having, having us. us. We appreciate it. Awesome. Oof.